Well, we are in the uh, Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're going to wrap up chapter one today. <laughs> it's only been four weeks, so, you know, multiply that out. I told you it'd be two to three years. So we'll, we'll get it done. All right. We're going to be in Luke chapter one uh, this morning. But before we do, give you the 30 second uh, overview of what uh, this gospel indeed is all about. In all of its glory and all of its uh, simplicity, right? Jesus, a friend of sinners. I hope that by the time that we're through with the Gospel of Luke, that not only is that good news indelibly impressed upon your heart, your mind, your soul, um, but that it is the catalyst for praise and thanksgiving in your heart and uh, soul. Jesus, friend of sinners. Well, In Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through uh, verse 80, the the title of this message today is the first New Testament prophecy. And I got good news for you. The good news is there's not one single command in these 24 verses, so you don't need to obey anything. (laughs) All you got to do today is listen. (laughs) Listen. Listen to this amazing prophecy. You see, after Zacharias was muted because of his unbelief, once he got his voice back, what he said was powerful and prophetic. And with with his voice back, he utters the first prophecy in the New Testament. Wow, what a way to get your voice back. Amen. Amen. You know, I think for all of us, there are times when our voice can become muted, and it's time that faith bring our voice back, that, uh, that we have that voice that praises God and sings and proclaims his goodness and his greatness. I believe that Luke is really drilling down on that in chapter 1 as he is setting the stage for us to see this one who is coming, who is the friend of sinners, the sinner's friend, the sinner's savior. He he underscores that we, we get our voice back. We get our voice back when? We recognize the grace of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, for a lost and a dying world, when we begin to grasp, when we begin to meditate on and think about what God has done for sinners, we get our voice back. Let's see this unfold today in Luke chapter 1. I'm going to invite you to stand in honor of God and his holy word. And we're not going to read all 24 verses. We, uh, at this time, we'll get through them all today, but. Let's pick up just the prophecy itself, beginning in verse 67. And his father, speaking of John, to the birth of John, his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed, the first word, blessed, the Latin is benedictus, which gives the the benedictus hymn. The song of praise from Zacharias. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Zacharias isn't speaking about John here. Zacharias is not from the house of David, and yet he says God has accomplished redemption. It is so sure, so 
so steadfast that this one, John the Baptist, would be the forerunner of the one who would come and who would get the job done. He puts it in the past tense. And he identifies not his son, but the son to come from the house of David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, now he turns to John, you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and under the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Let me just add uh, parenthetically, I don't have it in the message because I figured I didn't have time, so I'll put it down Figure that out. Why it's, I have time to do it now, but not in the sermon. Anyway, um, yeah. I, I want you to grasp something here. This is the first prophecy of the New Testament. And he ties it to the very last prophecy of the Old Testament. You see, the last prophet, Malachi, in the last chapter, chapter 4, gives the last prophecy before the silence of, Uh, fell upon the nation of Israel. And that last prophecy of the Messiah was this. The son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. The last prophecy before silence fell upon the nation. And now, 400 years later, the first prophecy of the New Testament the first voice of God heard upon the nation for 400 years, and he threads it together. The sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and under the shadow of death. What a prophecy. Let's go to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your holy word this morning. And Lord, I would pray that your spirit would open our eyes to the wonder of this great prophetic revelation at the onset here, declaring your grace, your tender mercies being shown forth to rescue those of us in bondage, in darkness, and under the shadow of death. For that, we give you thanks in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Okay, like I said, no commands, so you can rest easy and just listen. The first 10 verses, verses 57 through verse 66, deal with the naming of, of John. Let's take a look at it. The time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. She gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. Remember, as we preached earlier, that, uh, that Zacharias and Elizabeth were far past childbearing age when Gabriel visited Zacharias in the temple and told him that he would bear a son and that the son should be called John. So in verse 59, it's happened. Elizabeth has given birth, and now it's at the dedication. It happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. 
And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. They, they didn't trust Elizabeth. And so what does, John, does Zacharias do? He asked for a tablet and wrote his following. His name is John. I like that. He didn't say his name will be called John. He said, it's already a done deal, y'all. His name is today, but uh, his name's, it's already been established in heaven. It's John. And they were astonished. And at once his mouth was open, his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around him. And all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. Wow. You see, let's set the stage here. Um, the, uh, the picture is Elizabeth, Zacharias finally get their child after all these many years, and they present them for circumcision on the eighth day according to the law, and that's when he would receive his name. The reason for that is because it goes all the way back to Genesis and God's requirement to Abram that he would to be, was to be circumcised. And when he was circumcised, God gave Abram a new name, Abraham. And so... From that emerged the idea that was prevalent throughout the culture that on that day, the day of introduction into the covenant would be the day that you received your name, representative of how God renamed Abram on that day of circumcision. So that was the, that was the picture uh, going on. And so they came and, hey, look, there's only one name, right? I mean, think about it. Here is an old couple past childbearing age who had prayed for a child for so many years and finally, with no hope of any other children to come, finally is answered, there's only one logical choice, Zach Jr., right? I mean, look, there's just no other option. It's got to be Zach Jr., And so when Elizabeth says, no, it'll be John. Are you kidding me? Why? Because, see, the the angel Gabriel had told Zacharias, you will name him John. Because John means God, the Lord's gracious gift. Yahweh combined with Natan to give, to give graciously. So your, your hand... To give, the Lord gives graciously. And so the picture that God wanted to communicate to the nation is he was about ready to do something so special. His grace and his mercy was going to be poured out in such full measure that, that uh, we were going to get a, an understanding of God's grace and mercy to a lost, a dying world, to a sinful world, to a broken world. And so the naming of John was the Lord preparing us for the opening of a, of a new and glorious day when he would visit his people with the power of his grace and his mercy poured out upon us. See, unbelief had muted Zacharias, right? Unbelief had caused Zacharias to lose his voice, but it was now faith in God's gracious gift and it's not speaking of his son as he starts off in this prophecy. It is, it is his son is the forerunner of this gracious gift. And he is setting the stage by his name of what God would bring to the, uh, uh, not only to the nation, but to this world. And so it was this powerful understanding that now has set Zachariah, has given Zacharias his voice back. And, but not only does Zacharias speak, He prophesies. I mean, think about it. Once he gets his speech back, once he he is overwhelmed by God's graciousness to a broken world, he not only speaks again, 
he, he begins to speak prophetically. The first time that, that God's word has spoken over the nation in over 400 years. What a powerful picture. But he's not talking about his son. He's talking about the sinner's friend and the sinner's savior. It is this prophetic voice of God's great, gracious gift that is coming for this world. And so Zacharias breaks out into this benedictus, this blessing. Isn't it interesting that that when people are overwhelmed with God's grace, what God has provided, they break out in song. We've already seen it with Mary. Now we see it with Zacharias. We're going to see it with the angels in chapter 2. It's that picture here that when God gives us the voice back, it is because we are filled with an understanding of God's blessing for a lost and a dying world, and we want to sing of it. We want to declare it. That's what we do here when we, when we worship in, in song and in praise and, and in message today. It is simply just tuning our voices to be out there with that good message. Amen? That's, that, that's what it's all about. And so he breaks out into this great psalm. And when you look at uh, verses 67 through 79, let me ask you, what verbs jump out at you? Right? I mean, could it be in verse 68 that he has visited us and accomplished redemption? How about verse 69 that he has raised up a horn of salvation for us, horn representing might? How about 72? He has shown mercy toward us and remembered his covenant. How about verse 74? He's granted us having been rescued that we might serve. Maybe it's verse 77. He's given us the knowledge of salvation. Verse 79, that he has shown upon us in darkness and in the shadow of death to bring us peace. Wow. Which would you choose? It's hard to choose, right? I'll choose for you. Okay. We can't go through all of them, so let's just pick visited. He starts off, sets the tone by this great word. I want to bless you, the Lord God of Israel, because you have visited us. Accomplishing redemption. You see, the good doctor chooses a word here that he would have known, been very familiar with, and actually has made our way into the medical world. It is the Greek word, uh, I'll, I'll secularize, episcopus. It's epi is the prefix, scopus is the, uh, the root. Scopus, or if you were to pronounce it in the Greek, uh, episcopus, right? But uh, I'll break it down for you. So scopus, scope, scope. What does a scope mean? It's from the Greek word which means to look. So a stethoscope looks at the chest. An episcope is a word that was used that had a broader meaning. It was one who looked, looked at a condition with mercy. That's the word visited. This visit was, was special beyond belief because this visit was God himself becoming man for the purpose of looking at our great need and coming to do something about it. Episcopus. That's where we get Episcopalian or the Episcopy. It is one who who shepherds, looks after. God had visited his people, the Bible says, in many different ways, but never like this. No, we are being introduced to a visit that is simply beyond what man could have ever imagined, and that's why Zacharias gets his voice back. 
You see, yes, the Bible says in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4 that God had visited his people when he raised up Moses to uh, bring them out of the bondage of Egypt. Yes, in Ruth chapter 1, we read that God had visited the people in the, pla- in the famine by bringing them bread. But this visit, oh, this visit is different because now God is coming himself. God is going to take on flesh. God is going to be born in the form of a little baby. He is coming for us, but he is not coming for us just to say, okay, what a mess y'all have made of it. He is coming to rescue. He is coming to our help. He is coming uh, toward us. To do what? To accomplish something. His visit has a purpose behind it. It is to accomplish redemption, to buy us out of the slave market of sin uh, and, and bondage to sin that we were in. This visit had a purpose to it. Praise God. Amen. It was to accomplish redemption. No wonder. Ah, we'll get to it in about two years. But no wonder. When Jesus, in Luke 19, presents himself and makes his way down the Mount of Olives, and all the kids start waving the palm branches, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and he rides the donkey down through the eastern gate, comes into the temple area, and the religious reject him. What does the Bible, what does Luke say he did? Ah, and he uses the same word. He said that Jesus wept because he said, I would have gathered you in like a hen gathers its chicks, but you were unwilling because you have missed your hour of visitation. He missed it. You missed this special visit of God. Luke says, at the very onset, we got a visit coming. Sinners, you got a visitor. And this visitor, he's coming for you. He's coming. He sees your misery. He sees your hurt. He sees your spiritual brokenness. And he's coming for you. This is that special visit. You know what he's got on his heart and his mind? It is redemption. It is to accomplish redemption for you. That's what this visit is all about. That's what it looks like to accomplish redemption for his people and for this world, as verse 78 and 79 communicate. It is redemption from the slavery to sin, to reclaim us so that we can be whole again. Wow, what a visit. Not only can I be rescued from the bondage of sin, but made whole again. What a visit. That's what it's all about. What does that look like? This redemption and reclamation work about God in his visit to us. What does it look like? You know, I think of a beautiful poem that I I actually memorized when I was uh, in high school. And I'm so confident I didn't even bother putting it here and almost froze in the first service. That tells you how good I know this song. Um, Called The Old Violin. You ever heard it? It was battered and scarred. The auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while. Waste much time with that old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I big, good folk, he cried. Who started the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar? Two? Only two? Two dollars? Who'll make it three? (laughs) Going for three, but no. From the room far back, the old gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet like the caroling angel sings. When the music ceased, the auctioneer, now with a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now what am I bid for this old violin? He held it up with a bow. 
$1,000, who'll make it two? $2,000, who'll make it three? 3000 once, 3000 twice, going, gone, cried he. And people cheered, but some of them cried. We don't understand. What changed its warp? Quick came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. Any a man with life out of tune, battered and scarred by sin, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never quite understands the worth of a soul and the change that is brought by the touch of the master's hand. That's what this visit is all about. That's what this visit is all about. It is the literal touch of the master's hand upon broken souls and lives with his healing grace. Ah, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. You know what that looks like? That means total victory. This visit would, all, would be about a total victory. That's why this redemption is, is called the horn of salvation. In the Old Testament, the horn had two symbols to it. It was one of might and strength of an animal represented by his horns, and it was one of cornucopia, Blint, uh, plenty, uh, the blessings. And so the first picture here is that this is total victory. It is being described as the, verse 69, as the horn of salvation that has been raised up. The picture is raised up against all manner of opposition. Jesus came to cancel our debt. He came to open the prison doors. He came to set the captives free. He came to defeat the enemy of sin, death, the grave, hell, Satan himself. Amen. And he did it with great and glorious power. It is a powerful redemption. You know, I got to tell you this, this past week, I've been cleaning out the debris in the back of our uh, uh, yard and, and uh, you know, spring snakes on. I'm going back there. So I was going back there this, uh, this week. Had my big old trusty dog with me, but just in case he didn't do anything, I had a, had a shovel and my machete attached to my side, right? <laughs> and I'm going out into the back. I'm clearing stuff out, and, and I'm also kind of looking around for what I figured has got to be gathered around somewhere, and that'd be some snakes around, right? And so I, I, my, with my dog on my left, I look over to my right, and about two, two and a half feet away is, sure enough, a copperhead. My dog doesn't do anything. <laughs> so, uh, so, but you know what? I was armed. I had my shovel. I had my machete. Let me tell you, I won. It lost. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So that night, I'm saying, I'm, you know, telling Kim about this, and uh, oh, it was cool, and I took care of that. Uh, uh, that she she asked what any female asks: Did you give it proper burial? <laughs> Did you get rid of it? And of course, I'm not gonna lie. Well, no. Well, you know, copperhead, poison snake can still bite when it's dead. I looked at her and I said. Trust me, it ain't got a bite left in it. <laughs> not with a hammer, not with a machete. Uh, there wasn't a bite left in it. It was obliterated. And my dog didn't do one thing. <laughs> Dear friend, when God says that he was coming, to accomplish something. I want you to understand this. This hit me so powerfully this week. Jesus is the full force of God to rescue us. Not just a force, 
not just one of many options God had. Jesus was, is, and forever will be the full force of God unleashed upon sin, death, the grave, hell, Satan himself to crush our enemies and to redeem us. Jesus is the full force. And when Jesus got through on that cross and proclaimed it is finished, he could say, there ain't a bite left in him. There ain't a bite left in sin. There ain't a bite left in the grave. It's over with. It was no match because God didn't play around. He brought the full force of glory upon our enemy. That's what this prophecy is about. That's what this visit is all about. It is driving home that when he talks about this one who comes as a friend of sinners, you know why he's such a friend? Because he took on the enemy. You know, a friend isn't one who just says, well, you just stay in your sin or you just stay in your men. Oh, you got, you, you, you know, you're, you're addicted to drugs here. Let me give you more drugs. That ain't no friend. That's your enemy. The friend is saying, I'll go through hell itself back and back with you to get you out of this mess. That's your friend. And so Luke here is introducing us to the true sinner's friend, the sinner's Savior. And he's coming with the full force of glory to accomplish his mission of redemption. Wow. Now, it's been about 10 minutes longer than I should have come back. It's powerful. It's prophetic. Look at verse 70, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning, literally, from of old. From Genesis 3, at the fall of man, God gives Eve the prophecy that from her seed would come the one who would crush the serpent. It's, it's from of old. You can't go back any further. God has always proclaimed he would get the job done for man in his brokenness. It is powerful, it is prophetic, and it is purposeful, dear friend. Whoops. It is purposeful. It, it, look at verse 74 and 75. To grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. No matter what state you were found in as a captive, the Redeemer puts health healing, soundness, wholeness, and purpose back into your life. God doesn't rescue you and then put you on a shelf and say, well, you know, I really can't use you, but I'm glad I saved you. When the Redeemer comes, when he accomplishes redemption, he not only buys you out of the market of slavery, he puts you into service. He restores soundness and wholeness and healing and purpose back into your life. In fact, you know when you grasp redemption, when you start looking for ways to serve the Redeemer. Instead of running away from opportunities to serve, you look for ways to serve. That's when you know you've grasped what redemption is all about. You start running towards service, not away from it. God has blessed us with so many kids running all around here. It's crazy, right? We got a lot of service opportunities. <laughs> and uh, you know what? Not one of those little children should be left unserved. What can I do? Well, I can share with them the redemptive story of God in my life. You know, that's a pretty good start. You know, with all the great opportunities God has given us upstairs, as a sit one, serve one, as well as uh, VBS, man. Today, there shouldn't be one VBS uh, vacancy, right? Because we should run to service when we grasp the redemption. I have been saved to serve 
my king, and I'm so overwhelmed at what he has done in my life. I just got to tell somebody, even if it's a little three-year-old. Let me tell them the good news. Let me, let me place into their heart that treasure at an early age. Oh, God, I'll do that. Sign me up. It's no ennobling. You see, redemption ennobles all service, doesn't it? Redemption ennobles all service. There's nothing beneath us because it is an opportunity to sing his praises. It's purposeful and then it's plenteous. The horn of plenty is plenteous. You see, a new day has dawned where the sunrise from on high will visit us with healing in his wings for those who sit in darkness who thought they had no hope oh no uh uh-uh he is risen with healing he's coming for you he's going to accomplish his work and it's for all of us for all sinners and for all time it's like Zacharias said you know what I'm glad God robbed me of my speech because you know what I was just kind of going through the motions God's awakened me now and he has awakened me to this, def- this is my defining moment. That, that the first words out of my mouth after this discipline of God in my life are praise for the visit of God. Oh, thank you, God, that I will forever be known. This legacy marker in my life, I'll forever be known, not as the guy who got his voice muted, but the guy who speaks for the first time after 400 silent years speaks the word of God upon people who sit in darkness and under the shadow of death. Oh, thank you for redeeming, for proving, letting me be the poster child of what this visit looks like. You heal, you restore, and you put the psalm back into my lips. That's redemption. The new day, the new dawn has come for all of us. I'm going to post on the website the applications for today so you can, uh, you can check on the website for those applications. But let me just close by saying this to you. When, when Zacharias was saying this and speaking this prophecy, here's, here's how I envisioned this played out at the end. He's talking about God's visit And then all of a sudden, he looks down at his little eight-day-old little forerunner, John. I could envision him bending down, scooping him up, and holding him close. And then putting his right hand of favor upon him, whispering to John. Maybe it's John sleeping. And I could hear him say these last verses. And you, child. You, child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High God. For you will go before the Lord to prepare the ways of this visit. To give to his people the knowledge of his salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of God. with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine on those who sit in darkness and under the shadow of death to guard them and to guide them into peace. You, son, you, you will be the forerunner of this visit. He lays them down. You'll be the forerunner. Let me ask you, was John really that? (laughs) John did such a good job that he gave the most, the clearest, most concise testimony of this good news that the world has ever heard. That's how good a forerunner he was. In fact, it was so good, we still use it today. Behold the Lamb of God who takes 
away the sin of the world. Good job, John. Zacharias got his voice back. It's time you get your voice back. Don't leave here today muted. It's time to get overwhelmed by the visit of God for you. It's time to get your voice back. The voice of praise. A purpose. A blessing. Make this your benedictus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises of your word. We thank you for this wonderful gospel and what it reveals about what we need. The sinner's friend, the sinner's savior. Thank you, O Lord God Almighty, that you visited us and you accomplished what you came to do. Redemption, restoration, rescue, and reclamation. For that we praise you, both now and forevermore, with a voice that, O Lord God, may it never be muted. May we always sing of the new dawn. In your holy name we pray and all God's people said, amen.